that's the way we translate the verse. Okay, first, it's impossible that it's child, child bearing. The best it could be is child rearing. Okay? So the translation might be, God said to the woman, I will greatly increase your pain in child rearing. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because now the, the child will resist the influence of the woman and it will be a long, painful process to see children grow up. If that's not the case, I don't know what planet you're on, but that's generally the way children are. Okay? If that were true, it would still be representative of something that I don't believe God would ever do. That is, to punish someone else in a way that doesn't fulfill the measure-for-measure measure principle. So about 150 years ago, a, Hebrew, a woman who was a Hebrew scholar noticed that the way that this is translated depends on uh, two points. I don't know if, you, if you've ever read a Hebrew text, but there's pointing. Uh, little dots and dashes under the, under the consonants. To t yeah, vowel points. But there's more than vowel points. There's also the end of sentences and a bunch of other stuff. And this, a shiva, is pointed so that it tells you where the syllables break. Now this is really important. Because if I remove the shiva in this line, I get the same I get the same translate or the same words, but now this word changes from arbe to arab because of the way the syllables break. And this doesn't mean greatly increase, it means the one who seduced you, the one who caused you pain. So here's what the verse would translate. God said to the woman, the one who caused you pain. Not, I will greatly increase. It's not punishment. He's describing what actually happened. Someone came and seduced you and caused you great pain. Okay? All right. As a result of that, God says, you will, you will teshuka for your husband and he will rule over you. Okay? Now, the way that that's translated in most Christian texts is, you will desire your husband, but he will rule over you. The reason it's translated that way is because there was a, there was a Catholic monk named Pagnino who mistranslated the Hebrew in 1528 or something, and he translated teshuka as, as lust. And so what he, when he translated the verse, he translated it like this. You will lust for your husband, but he will rule over you. The Catholic Church grabbed a hold of that idea and taught that women had an insatiable sexual desire for their husbands. After all, that's obviously true. Every man knows that. And that they had to be controlled, right? In other words, they were emotional creatures. They didn't have rational control. And so men who were rational, organized, <laughs> deliberate, had to keep those women under control. And the way they did that was the invention of chastity belts and nunneries and all. I mean, because after all, you can't let the women loose or they'll just go berserk, right? Okay, that's the idea of the Catholic Church. Of course, it's self-serving because the Catholic Church hierarchy is all male, right? But what it means is it gives theological justification for the idea that a woman can't control herself and a man must exercise control over her. In other words, he must be the authority in her life to keep her from making mistakes, right? After all, she brought sin into the world and men must make sure that that doesn't happen again, okay? So when Pagnino... <coughs> when <coughs> Pagnino... <coughs> translated this verse, he portrayed women as essentially irrational, emotional, out of control creatures. Now, evangelicals don't like the idea of lust very much because they're basically against sex to begin with. So they changed the word from lust to desire. So you will find in most translations, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Same idea, just toned down a bit, okay? What happens when I look at this word? It only, it only occurs three places, twice in this story, once in Genesis um, 4, 7, and once in Song of Songs 7, 10. <clears throat> it never means lust. It means 
to turn. So what the actual verse means is, you turned toward your husband, but he will roll over you. In other words, it's not a statement of punishment. It's a statement of fact. It's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. What happened is this. Hava, Eve, made her decision to care for her husband stronger than her decision to listen to God. She should have been tuned into what God was saying, but in fact she thought to herself, I can be a much better Azir Konegdo if I just take over for myself the, the operation of deciding what's good and what's bad. In other words, here's what the serpent suggests. Remember, the serpent doesn't ask a question. He agrees, right? Here's what the serpent suggests. Are you the Azir Konegdo? Weren't you designed? to direct your husband as to what is right and wrong? What's the matter with you? You can't make up your own mind? You have to go run off to God every time you have a question and ask him? Didn't he make you with free choice? Can't you decide for yourself what's good? After all, he built you that way. Why are you afraid to make a choice? Right? The serpent is convinced, is seducing her into actually taking what God said and deciding for herself whether it has value. In other words, the way that God's commands work like this. God says it, I do it. What Hava, what Eve did is, God said it, I think about whether it's good for me, then I decide if I'm going to do it. That's all that's necessary. All that's necessary to change the equation is to enter in the one thing that says, I will now evaluate what God says to decide if it's good for me. Right? So let me give an example. God says he doesn't want you to eat pork. You say, yeah, but what's the matter with pork? I mean, come on, we have all the refrigeration, we have all the... I, I, I guess maybe, it, I understand that God might have said that to people in the past, but we don't have those issues today. You see what you're doing? You're deciding whether or not what God said is good for you. And then you make a choice. Or you decide not to eat shrimp. I mean, we're talking about dietary laws because the first commandment was a dietary law, right? So God says he doesn't want you to eat shrimp. And what do you say? Well, okay, I won't eat shrimp. And the reason I won't eat shrimp is because I know that they're bottom feeders in the ocean. They're not healthy for me. They carry mercury, etc., etc. That's not what God said. God said he doesn't want you to eat shrimp because they're garbage cans of the ocean. He said he doesn't want you to eat shrimp, period. Right? If you don't eat shrimp because you're justified it on the basis of health considerations, mm -hmm. you've essentially entered into the ethical decision before just saying, I just do what God says. Now, let me give you a, a story about Veronica. <clears throat> Veronica is a... Veronica lives in El Salvador. I don't know if you know anything about El Salvador, but basically El Salvador was a declared Catholic country from, its, from the time that the you know, new world was opened up, right? So most people in El Salvador are nominally Catholic. There's about 20% of the people that are now evangelical as a result of missionary activities. But almost everybody in El Salvador is saturated with some sort of Christian idea, right? They're either Catholic by fiat or they're evangelical by choice, okay? When, when I met Veronica, she, worked, uh, she works as a receptionist in a hotel, in a Holiday Inn hotel. She makes $1.85 an hour. She lives in the barrio. She supports her mother and her alcoholic father, right? And, I mean, she's living on less than $200 a month, okay? So, so I thought, well, I want to do something good for Veronica because I just want to, you know, I felt compassion for her. So I said, okay, look, Veronica, um, we, the, the other guy was with me, we'll, we'll take you out to dinner and, you know, we'll get her a really good meal and at least that can help, right? And so we go to one of the big restaurants there and we sit down. And I don't know if you know anything about the, di the major diet of Central America, but it's rice, beans, and pork, right? And maybe chicken. Okay, so we order. And as we're ordering, uh, I see the menu and, and Veronica says to me, well, I don't eat pork. And, I, and I'm, this is really surprising to me, because in Central America, pork is a big delicacy, right? You can afford, you can get chicken all the time, but pork costs money, so. So I said to her, uh, how come you didn't eat pork? And she says, well, the Bible says not to eat it. And I said, um, well, what do you think about the other food? She says, well, I just do what the Bible says. And I said, well, Veronica, 
when do you worship God? She says, well, I worship on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. I said, why? Because everybody in that community, worship, all the evangelicals worship on Sunday, all the Catholics worship on Sunday. So why is Veronica worshiping on the Sabbath? She says, well, that's what the Bible says. In other words, stripped of the cultural influences of the religions, all she did was read the Bible and do what it says. And I thought to myself, how much simpler can it get? We're the source of the woman. The man. What is the source of the man? The earth. The earth resists the man. That's his punishment. He now has to work hard at making what was designed to benefit him actually do what it's supposed to. What resists the woman? The man. He now, the source of the woman is the man. He now resists her in a way that makes it harder for her to accomplish the purpose that she was designed to. In other words, she wants to be the Azir Konegdo, she's designed to be the Azir Konegdo, she's intended to be the Azir Konegdo, but guess what? The object of the Azir Konegdo is the husband. And now he says, I will not listen to you anymore. I listened to you once and look what happened to me. Ah, so it comes down to this. Adam says to the Azir Konegdo, <clears throat> you know that advice you gave me? Never admitting that he's actually the one who caused it all. Look what you did to me. Do you think I'm ever going to listen to you again? Absolutely not. From now on, I will make the decisions. In other words, you turned toward your husband, but now he will rule over you. In other words, it's exactly the reverse of what God intended. The whole relationship gets turned upside down. <coughs> as a result of her decision to make the choice on her own instead of listening exactly to what God wanted. That's all. She doesn't get punished because she committed the first sin, etc., etc. The punishment comes because the source of her being now fights against her. Okay? But it's, but it's not a, a punishment from him. He's just explaining what's going to happen. That's right. But it's exactly the same thing that's what's going to happen with the earth. The earth is now going to resist. So the, the punishment is the inevitable consequence of disturbing the intended order. Right? It's not as though God stands up there and says, how can I get these people? God is a compassionate God. He loves his creation. He wants it to work. But the choices that they've made have now inevitably caused difficulties. Okay? How do I know that? Because at the end, what does God, excuse me, what does God do at the end? There's a really important thing that happens at the end of that chapter. What does God do? He provides a covering. Right? In other words, He reestablishes their rightful role as priest and priestess in the world. He establishes one more time that this is what He intended. Right? How does He do that? The words that are used for covering there are exactly the same words that are used for Aaron's royal robes. In other words, he installs them as priest and priestess after the sin. That means God forgives. Okay? <clears throat> Which makes it even more difficult for me to believe that he would continue to punish a woman on and on and on every time she has a child. God forgives. He reestablishes the order he intended. And then he says, go on and make the garden the size of the globe. Okay? <clears throat> we got all that? Okay, so there's a couple of verses that help me understand how that works, and we'll look at those in the Old Testament after we take one aside. And that one aside is Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. A really important verse to see what happens when dysfunctionality enters into the picture. Because the relationship is a mess now, right? The relationship is a mess because Adam won't accept responsibility, he blames her, she... It ends up being frustrated all the time because he no longer listens to her. On and on and on, the relation is dysfunctional. Okay. Uh, by the way, we have we have to add one more thing before we can get to chapter four, verse one. And the one more thing we have to add is, where does she get her name? <coughs> What's the woman's name to this point? She doesn't have one. She has. Is there a connecto? her functional role, and Isha, the relational role, okay? Does she have a name? No. 
Who gives her the name? Adam. Adam. Oh, that's interesting. What else did Adam name? Oh, isn't that interesting? In other words, by naming her, he establishes his relationship to her as equivalent to the relationship with the animals. Right? That's what naming means. In Hebrew, to name is to take ownership, to take control over. Okay? So he names her. What does he name her? Eve. Ah, well, not exactly. Because I don't know where Eve comes from. <laughs> Somebody made that up out of some pagan legend. Because in Hebrew, it's Chava. Chava, right? Okay. So he names her Chava. And the verse says, And the man named the woman Chava because what? Mother of all living. Because she was the mother of all living. But if Chava meant the mother of all living, the narrator wouldn't have to tell you what it means. Right? If I use the word uh, soft verges, do I have to tell you what that means? In Britain, do you know what soft verges are? What? Yeah. 35 years ago you would. Now it's called hard shoulders. Mm -hmm. Okay? Do you know what hard shoulders are? Yeah. I don't have to tell you, since you're British. And by the way, when you drive down the road and you see the word hard shoulders, that means that the edge of the road is hard enough so that you could drive on it without sinking. And soft verges is exactly the opposite. If you drive off the road, you're going to sink. Okay? I don't have to tell you that if you're British, because you know what it means, because you're British. So would I have to tell you the meaning of a Hebrew word if you're Hebrew? No. I only have to tell you the meaning of a word in Hebrew if it doesn't mean that in Hebrew. And so I have to explain to you what it means. Right? Well, you have the same thing happening in the apostolic writings, by the way. When Yeshua goes in and, and heals the 12-year-old and raises the 12-year-old girl from the dead. He speaks in Aramaic. Remember that? And then Mark tells you, as he's writing about this, uh, which means, and then he tells you, right? Why does he tell you what, what it means? Because you don't know. Because the people who are reading it don't read Aramaic, and so they have to be, it has to be explained to them. Okay? So now, here comes the narrator, and he says, Chava, which means the mother of all living, which means the word Chava doesn't mean the mother of all living. So what does the word Chava mean? And the interesting thing about this is it doesn't have a Hebrew meaning because it's not a Hebrew word. Okay? If you read Nam Sarna's commentary on Genesis, he goes on a search to find out what this word actually means. And he finds it in a book from another culture. And guess what the word means? Serpent! Oh my goodness. So here's what Adam does. He says, by the way, for the rest of your life I'm going to call you by what I think you really are. Serpent. So serpent, get me some lunch. Serpent, take out the laundry. Serpent, take care of the children. And by the way, just so that you won't forget that I'm in charge, serpent. You see what's happening? Okay. So here's the, here's the root of the whole issue. Adam never forgives. Adam installs her in the role of an animal, the worst kind of animal you could ever be, the one who caused all the problem, and reminds her every single day that she is nothing more than her sin. Right? I mean, this is in, in, our, in our culture, we could sue for divorce on the grounds of verbal abuse. Right? But think about what happens to the dynamic of the relationship when this occurs. Right? Now go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. I mean, sorry, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Okay? This is the only place in all of Scripture where Hava actually says something. So it becomes very important because we want to see what the dynamics of the relationship turn out to be. And by the way, this is the lesson for dysfunctional families. Because we got dysfunctional, we got a dysfunctional couple now, right? But there's no children involved yet. Okay? We have a dysfunctional couple because the husband doesn't forgive. He won't let her be the Azer Konegdo. She's frustrated all the time because she's designed to be something she can't be anymore. So she does something about it. What does it say in 4.1? What does have, it say? I have acquired a man. Oh, no. Read the whole sentence because you've got to start at the beginning. Okay. The man had sexual relations with Hava, his wife. She conceived, gave birth to uh, Cain, acquisition, and said, I have acquired a man from Adonai. Okay, great. Now we're going to see why it can't possibly mean that. Okay? 
The first thing, of course, is that in some of your translations it will say, and Adam knew his wife Eve. But it can't mean that because it says ha-adam. It doesn't say Adam. It says the Adam, which can only mean the man, right? Because just like most proper names, you don't start the name with the. It's not the Jono, the Rachel, the Craig. It's Jono, Rachel, and Craig, right? So if I put the definite article before the word, that means I'm not talking about the man, Adam. I'm talking about the man, okay? Now, why is that important? Because in my view, if it were an intimate relationship between two people, you would use names. But this is not an intimate relationship. This is an attempt to, to replace Adam with somebody who will allow her to be the Azer Konegdo, namely a child. So she only needs Adam for one thing, to get pregnant. Any man would do, he just happens to be the only one around. Right? So the man has sex with his wife. And she bears a child whom she names, not him, whom she names Cain. Well, that's really important. We're going to see why. Okay? And then she says, and in most translations it says, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Yeah. But interestingly enough, it says in Hebrew, I have acquired, bartered, negotiated. That's the verb. I've negotiated, and here's what you expect it to say, a child. But it doesn't say yeled. It says, Ish, I have acquired, negotiated, a new, fully grown adult male, but that's not what it means. What does Ish mean? The sum of all the relationships that make me who I am. Right? In other words, I've transferred the notion that I have identity with Adam to now the identity that I have with my child. And by the way, I'm going to treat that child as though it's a replacement of Adam. Right? Because now the Ish is no longer Adam, the Ish is the child, right? That's deliberate. She says, I have replaced this man who will not let me be the Azer Konegdo. I've replaced him, and now here comes the impossible Hebrew construction. Oh, I don't have it up here, so I can't show you. In Hebrew, there is a linguistic marker, et, which indicates that the next verb, next word in the subject in the uh, sentence is always the direct object. So tell me what's the direct object in this sentence? I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. What's the direct object? Man. Man, right. I subject verb have acquired direct object man. But the et comes before Yahweh, not before ish. In other words, it says et Yahweh not et ish, which means that from Chava's perspective, the direct object of her sentence is, is okay. God, not the man. So that's an impossible grammatical construction. It doesn't make any sense in Hebrew, except that in her mind, she's not bartering in order to get a child. She's using God as the partner to get what she wants, and the child is just an accidental benefit. It's God who's the direct object of her bartering, right? In other words, she casts herself as the general partner in the relationship, and God is the specific partner, the one who just acts as the genie to fulfill her wish. Right? And what's her wish? To replace Adam. Okay? So let me tell you how this works. You stop listening to her. Because once in a while, sometime in the past, she gave you some advice that didn't turn out the way you wanted it. So you start making all the choices. And you tell her, by the way, I'm king of this castle. And by the way, I'm the man in the house, and I'll be making the choices from now on. Thank you very much. Sure, you can tell me what you think, but I'm the one who makes the decisions. Okay? Guess what? She's still going to be the Azer Konegdo. Because she's designed to be the Azer Konegdo. Because it's blueprinted into her. Because she can't be anything but the Azer Konegdo. So guess what she's going to do? She's going to find somebody else to be the Azer Konegdo too. And the most obvious one is the child. Because the child doesn't resist her. The child welcomes nourishing, protecting, providing, directing, care, and comfort until the child gets to the point where it starts listening to the father. Right? The whole point is 
she uses the child as a replacement for what God intended her relationship to be with the husband because the husband won't forgive her and install her in the relationship as Eric Konegdo. She can't be other than as Eric Konegdo, so the child takes over the role of the husband. And pretty soon the husband comes home from work one day and he says, you know, you spend all your time with the kids. You never spend any time with me at all. Like, what happened? You know, we used to have fun together, but now all the time, you're just running around with the kids all the time. All you're doing is taking care of them. All you're doing is watching out for them. You never even pay any attention to me. And you know what she should do? She should walk up to him and go like this. It's all your fault. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, according to the design that God has in mind, if the husband doesn't allow her to be the Azar Konegdo, it doesn't mean she's going to stop being the Azar Konegdo. It means that it's going, to find, it's going to be diverted into something else. Now, she should put a halt to that and say, wait a minute, God never designed me to be the Azar Konegdo to my children. God designed me to be the Azar Konegdo to my husband. And the problem is, my husband won't let me be the Azar Konegdo, so we better go back to the Genesis account and start reading this again so that we can get an idea of what we're supposed to be like. Right? Otherwise, the children will take over the role of the Azar of the object of the Azar Konegdo, and the relationship will get worse, not better. And we see that because of what she names her child. Children learn from the behavior of the parents. She is in the, involved in negotiating. She's negotiating a deal with God. Cain learns exactly the same thing. Because when he brings his sacrifice, he tries to negotiate with God. He doesn't bring the best. He brings what's adequate. Right? He brings what he thinks will do, not what God expected. By the way, God doesn't punish him for that. God just says, why is your face downfalling? Right? Why are you in this funk? Just go back and make it right, and it'll be fine. What does he do? He blames his brother. Right? And the result is fratricide. It gets worse. Right? If you look at the Paleo-Hebrew, of the word Cain, you find something very interesting. You know, um, the Hebrew text wasn't written in block script Babylonian text. It was written in Paleo-Hebrew, right? Until the Babylonian captivity when the alphabet was changed. If you look at the Paleo-Hebrew for Cain, guess what you find? Weapon. Weapon. His, his name means weapon. Isn't that interesting? That she would name the son who's going to replace her devotion that she should have had for her husband, weapon. And the weapon becomes the one who kills her other son. I mean, it's so convoluted, so dysfunctional, so out of control. Why? Because Adam doesn't forgive. If Adam had forgiven her, like God did, and, and, and returned her to the role of Azar Konegdo, everything in the story would have changed. Right? So just like the man is the responsible party in Genesis 2.24 to make the commitment that makes the marriage dynamic work because she's already blueprinted for it, so the man is the responsible party to forgive and reinstall her as the Azar Konegdo when things go awry because he is, it's necessary for him to re-establish the relationship that God had. Right? Just like her agenda is supposed to be what God wants for her husband and not what God wants for her children. Sure, that's, a, that's important, but it's not the priority. The priority is you are the Azar Konegdo to your husband, not to your children. But because your husband won't let you be the Azir Konegdo, that means all that frustration that you have about someone that you just want to nourish and protect and care for, someone who responds to the way that you are loving toward them, that's what you really want, and you're going to find it no matter what. Right? And in this world, it's either children or an affair. Because you're going to find it. That's the way you're designed. Okay? So ultimately, when either one of the parties starts to go in, the, in a direction that God didn't design, the relationship becomes dysfunctional and it spins into the next generation and the next generation and the next generation so that by the time you get to Genesis 6, God says he's sorry he even made human beings. Right. Amazing, huh? Okay. So, let's look at 
Proverbs 31.10 and Song of Songs 8.6. Proverbs 31.10. So now we've looked at the Genesis account. Now we have to see, do these themes follow all the way through the rest of the Tanakh? Because if they do, then we've got a pretty good idea that the same issues are happening again and again and again. By the way, this, the, one of the reasons that Hebrew is so important is because Certain Hebrew words, when they're repeated in another story, tell us something about the theme that, that we're following, okay? So let me, let me um, give you an example. So Adam says to God, when he's confronted with the sin, that it was God's fault because of the woman who gave it to me. And what does he say? He said, oh no, I'm sorry, when the sin occurs, it says, in the, but the narrator says, and the man listened to the woman. Right? And he listened to the woman and consequently ate from the fruit. Okay? Tell me where the passage, he listened to his wife, comes up again in the Genesis account. Abraham. Abraham. Okay? So, here's the connection. Sarah, who's the Azer connector for Abraham, decides that she's going to assist God in the process of fulfilling the blessing that God promised to Abraham. How does she do that? She provides Abraham with fruit. She says, by the way, here's this lovely fruit that you can use to get the benefit that God promised. Okay? And the text makes the connection absolutely explicit when it says of Abraham, and he listened to his wife. Exactly the same phrase that you find in the Genesis account, because it wants you to realize that Abraham and Sarah is a repetition of the story of Adam and Hava. Right? God promises one thing. He tells him exactly how it's going to happen. Abraham knows how it's going to happen. Does Abraham say to Sarah when presented with Hagar, Oh, no, no. It's okay. God promised me that it was going to happen this way. Does he say that? No. Okay, what does he say? Oh, what a splendid idea. <laughs> I, always, I always wondered about that Egyptian maid. <laughs> I mean, the whole point is he doesn't stand up for what he knows God said. It's exactly the same pattern that you see with Adam and Eve. What happens as a result? Ishmael. Ishmael. And guess what? Ishmael is a dysfunctional relationship that goes on for 13 years before Sarah says, get that guy out of here and her mother. By the way, send him into the wilderness to die. You see what happens? The whole pattern is repeated again with all of the permutations of a new set of, of circumstance, couples, but it's the same theme. And by the way, you can find the same theme again and again and again and again because the same human activities occur over and over and over in different characters. Okay? So, now let's look at Proverbs 31.10. 31.10 says, by the way, Proverbs, if, if that poem, um, two things you need to know. First, the poem... Was, was written by, do you know who the poem was written by? The Proverbs 31 poem? Who was it written by? Well, actually, not exactly. It comes from the mother of, right, the mother of a pagan king. Oh, wait a minute. Are you telling me that a really important poem in, in Proverbs that we considered inspired by God was written by the mother of a pagan king? Yeah. It was borrowed because it had some truth in it. In fact, it has a lot of truth in it. And what does 31.10 say? It says that a man will trust his wife and it will be prosperous for him. Now, this is blessing in disguise because the word for trust is, is barak, right? It's the, or batak, sorry, it's batak. And it means, and by the way, it's only used of relationships between man and God in a positive <coughs> sense, except in this one case where it says the relationship is between a man and his wife. Every other time the word is used um, between human beings, it's always negative. Don't trust these people, don't trust those people, don't trust money, don't trust these advisors, da, 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 da. Okay? But in this case, it's positive. Only between a husband and wife. And what does it say? A husband will trust his wife, the same word that's used for a trust in God, and it will be what? Prosperous. In other words, if you listen to her, you'll benefit. Right? It's just not paying, by the way, it's not just hearing the words. I don't know how many times this has happened, but Roseanne, will, my wife, Roseanne, will come home and she'll start telling me about something and I'm thinking about something else. I'm writing on the computer, I'm reading emails or whatever, and then she'll say, you haven't heard a word that I've said. 
right? And I will say, no, and I will say, sure, I heard what you said, and then I'll repeat back to her. But I didn't hear it. I just recorded the words and played them back, right? She wanted me to actually hear what she said. So there's a difference between hearing and <coughs> receiving audio signals, okay? Now, what's really interesting about this is, it says a man will trust. And the idea of trust is that I listen with intent to obey, okay? So if I listen with intent to obey, that trust that I have with God, I will also have that kind of trust with my wife, and guess what will happen to me? I will receive the benefits that God intended in the blueprinted design of the Azer Connecto. In other words, it will be prosperous for me. So why don't men do that? I mean, think how crazy it is. The Bible actually says that if I listen to my wife, I'll benefit. So do men listen to their wives? No. No, why not? You're stupid. That's right, because they think they know better. Why? Because they believe, because they believe that their head of the house, king of the castle, the you know, prophet, priest, and king in the home, and they listen sometime in the past and it didn't work out the way that they thought it would, so they no longer trust. And if they take the trust out of the equation, then they don't listen. And they think, why should I listen to her? I remember when she told me such and such, right? Okay? In addition to which, women have this innate ability to remind you when you didn't listen, <laughs> even if it was 10 years later, or 10 years before, and of course that makes you feel like, why should I trust them? They're only going to remind me if it goes bad. <laughs> so, the dysfunctional relationship of not forgiving as soon as the event occurs, re-establishing the proper relationship in the Genesis account, means that the dysfunctionality carries on. And I don't get the benefit of Proverbs 31.10 because I stop listening to what she says because I don't trust her anymore. Right? All of which is exactly the opposite of what God designed in the Genesis 2 account. Okay? How about the next one? Song of Songs. The word here is Hatham. And by the way, it's not a Hebrew word. It's an Egyptian word. Right? It's a borrowed word from Egypt, and this is what it means. It means the little clay cylinder that royalty in Egypt used to mark identities. It's like a um, deed, right? They didn't have written deeds in those days. They would take this clay cylinder, this hard cylinder, and roll it around on clay, and it would leave marks. And those marks identified what property was owned by the pharaohs, or royal families, okay? So the woman in Song of Songs says to the, to the lover, um, and I just have to make this side remark. There's no suggestion in the Song of Songs that these people are married. That's, a, that's the Christian application because we don't like the fact that they could actually be lovers and have sex without them being married. But you see, marriage is a contractual social relationship. It has nothing to do with the relationship that they have before God. Okay? So we can do Song of Songs sometime. That would be really interesting. Okay? So in Song of Songs, the woman says, Take my hatham my cylinder and do what with it? Roll it across your arm and over your heart. Why? Because I own the deeds of your hands and the attitudes of your heart. And by the way, I'm not compelling you to do this. I'm asking you to do it. It's voluntary. You decide to roll the cylinder over your arm and over your heart. And when you do that, I own you. Okay? And of course, ownership is the same kind of function that God wants. So it's not ownership in the sense that now you're my slave and I can tell you to do whatever I want. It's ownership in the sense that this is the way that God owns you. Right? Yes? This is a quick question. And um, we're seeing something continually throughout the scriptures, the use of words that are not Hebrew. From yes. Your, in your opinion, looking at the narrators that are using these words, why do they do that? Why do they use words that are not Hebrew? Is there no equivalent in the Hebrew? Or is it that they, maybe they found a way that the Egyptian expresses the word or the thought much better? So why do they um, no, I think it's simply a matter of culture. Like, for example, you use the word bon voyage. You know, it's not English, but it's part of the English vocabulary now, although you know it's French. Or bon appetit, right? Ben provincial. Right? We just use words. We incorporate words. How about bureau? How about bureaucracy? Those aren't English words, they're French words, but they're now incorporated in our culture in such a way that they become part of our language. So in this case, 
many of the books in the Hebrew Bible are written in cultures where the influences of other cultures and the language of other cultures creeps into the text. Right? So, uh, for example, big well, portions... the mind of the rights of the Moshe at this point. Yeah. Big portions of Daniel are in Aramaic. Why? Because it was written in Babylon. That's why. And, by the way, we find, we find, this is really interesting, in the book of Ruth, we find Hebrew words that could not have been used during the time of Ruth, that only come from much later periods of time. But they're in that text. Why? Because the text wasn't written when Ruth was alive. It wasn't even written when David was alive. It was written much later about a story that happened much earlier, and they used the words that were popular in the culture at that time. So the same thing would be true of Moses. He borrows words from Egyptian. He borrows words from Babylonian. You know the story in, of, uh, this is interesting. Remember the ziggurat, when they build the Tower of Babel, okay? They use a Mesopotamian word for brick. Why? Because the Hebrews didn't make bricks, right? Egypt made bricks, and Hebrews didn't build with bricks, right? So they use a word that belongs to a Mesopotamian language in that story because there isn't any word in Hebrew, right? That kind of stuff happens, okay? So let's go back to this. Proverbs 31.11. Uh, oh, sorry, we talked about Proverbs 31.11. I'm in Jeremiah 31.22. Hadash and Savab, or Savab, right? Hadash. This is pro in Jeremiah 31:22 is a description of what happens in the millennial kingdom. Remember, this is the passage um, that is all about I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob. Right. So this is a description. By the way, this is the only place in the in the Tanakh where it talks about a new covenant. So it has to be what Yeshua was referring to when he says this is the new covenant. Right. Because he's referring to something in the Tanakh, and this is the only place where those words occur. So, what's interesting is, Hadash, of course, doesn't mean new, it means renewed. Like the new moon, right? It's not a new, brand new, God just created it moon. It's a, the same moon seen again, renewed, okay? So here's what Jeremiah says. He says, what is this? Surprising. In the new covenant, right? In the Hadash, renewed covenant, that is, in something that was already there, but is now going to be reestablished, he says, a woman will surround a man. So, guess what? If you can practice in your relationship the proper role between the husband and the Azer Konegdo, you will be practicing what happens in the Millennial Age. Because in the Millennial Age, a woman will surround a man. Right? A woman will take on, again, the role that she had in the Genesis account. It will return to what God intended. Really powerful stuff. If you think... It, I'm sorry? She'll guard him. Yeah, she'll surround him. She'll protect him. She'll mm -hmm. nourish him. She'll act as the Azer Kenegdo, which is the intention that God had. Because remember what, what Nekava means? Nekava means the boundary. Mm -hmm. So here she is surrounding him again. Right? In the meantime, we function in the Western Christian world as though men are the ones who are supposed to be taking care of business. Right? But in the Millennial Kingdom, God's going to restore what happened in the Genesis account. So and when he mention? does, a lot of men are going to be quite surprised. So what does a man, uh, what, what do men do then? What do men do? Yeah. Listen. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Listen and obey. And, I, and remember what God says. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's uh, Zakar. You are to remember what God says. And by the way, you know that that Zakar is connected to Shema. And Shema means? And? Obey. To hear and obey, right? He, would, he wouldn't know because he's, he's still not, he's new to all of this, so he wouldn't. Ah, so you're new to all this. Because you have visitors here today. Who Good luck. To my <laughs> Right. Yes. Skip, most of what you've been teaching today assumes that the woman actually wants to follow God's will. What do you do in a marriage where there might be a couple where the woman hasn't yet come to that understanding? What does it matter? You mean where the man has and the woman hasn't, or where neither yes. of them have? Well, just say both. Answer that for both. Okay, so let's start with the man has and the woman hasn't. Um, I haven't run across a relationship like that. Why? Because it's generally the case that the woman understands intuitively what all this is about and is frustrated because the man doesn't 
doesn't understand it yeah. and won't let her be what it is. Yeah. If you actually sit down and ask a woman, do you understand that you're supposed to be the nourisher, protector, provider, sustainer, chastiser, and punishment, guess what she's going to say? Yes, I understand that. And then I'm going to ask, well, why don't you do that? And she's going to say, because my husband gives me all kinds of grief. Yeah. So I think that what's actually happening is that she's hardwired to do that. Yeah. This is a new right? mode. Yeah. She's hardwired. <laughs> In other words, if if you just took your hand off, those are the things that she would do. Now, the question is, will she do those only with the agenda that this is what God wants? Or will she supplement it with this, with, this is what I want? And that's the temptation, right? It's never a problem for me to convince a woman that she's an Azer Konegda. They know it. The problem is that they know that they have that power and they use it to get what they want instead of what God wants. That's the issue. Yeah, so I don't yeah. have to convince a woman that she's a Zerconegdo. I just have to convince a woman that she needs to listen to what God wants, right? Mm -hmm. I have to convince the man that he can actually trust it. Mm -hmm. It's the man who's, who has all the resistance because he's afraid that if he turns over that kind of power to a woman, she's going to demand what she wants mm -hmm. instead of realizing that he has to bring what the Bible teaches into the relationship so that she can yeah. see that the way that she's designed is to be the vehicle by which God speaks into the relationship. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. Okay. Now, if neither one of them share those, then, then you get what happens in the 7.2 billion people on earth. I mean, that, the problem is we have little, little, tiny, tiny people who actually understand any of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And the, the difference is this, however, that if you really do what God says, my guess is that you won't have any problem attracting people to the question, how can you live like that? Because everybody else is fighting. Right? If you're actually doing what God says, and you became one page for absolute unity, people would come to you and say, I don't understand how your marriage works like that. Tell me what you guys do. Because everybody else is fighting. Right? Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, well, okay, so when he asked the question, I, I heard it differently, but, um, so I'm just curious myself, what happens when someone in a relationship knows that they're the nourisher and all that Is stuff, okay, right? but they don't have that role with God, and ah. so then the husband wants her to be in align with the will, Yes. but he himself is with somebody that has all the attributes of a woman and knows that she wants to nourish, but not in direct line with what... Right. Yeah, and then that, that becomes a, the real issue. Because then the <laughs> job of the husband is to help his wife see that the re relationship that she needs is the one where she directs what God wants in the marriage. And then that will be, will f be fulfilling to her and a blessing to him. It will be conflict. I think, you've already, I, think, I think the question was already answered was. earlier on because yeah. the, the, the witness of the, the Hebrew way of witness of what you li lifted up was about evangelizing, was about the way you live your life and then people get drawn and ask the questions. Right. And, and so I can speak in experience on that very subject that it, it was only when I started living as the man that God created me to be and stood up for that in my marriage could my wife then tune into that and 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 start, we could start moving together on it. So it, might, it was up to me to to walk the walk first. Yep. Absolutely. And that of course follows the Genesis two twenty three and twenty four verses, which says that it's up to you to create the relationship that she will then respond to. Yes. Yeah. I mean, neither party gets off the hook, right? But it's absolutely designed to function together. Yeah. Yes. Part of that uh, question, I I think, was also. So if that's a woman's role, then what is a man's role? And you said to listen. But it's also, I don't know if he's trying to understand, but from other things that you've said, is a man is aimed more at the community and a woman is, is towards the man and the uh, family. Okay, so we haven't answered that question yet, but we will because it comes from the Proverbs 31 passage. In the Proverbs 31 passage, you know, this is warrior poetry, and it's all about how... It's all about the strength of the woman, right? Remember, she gets up before dawn, she takes care of her family, she gets, clothes them in fine linen, she, doesn't, she laughs at danger because she knows that she's got protection, she buys property and sells it, she's involved in business, all kinds of stuff. What does her husband do? Ah, thank you very much. He sits in the city gate. What does that mean? 
judge. It means, what? It's the place of authority for what? It's the place of the authority for the community, the city. In other words, because he sits in the city gate, his focus is on the politics of the community. Her focus is on the integrity of the family. Right? And I don't mean she just takes care of the children. She's running an international business, for heaven's sake. She's got employees. She's got, I mean, she's doing all that stuff. She's fabulously capable. But what's his job? His job is to make sure that the integrity that happens in his home is displayed in the community so that the entire community is protected and righteous and lives according to God's plan. He sits in the city gate. The only reason he can do that is because he knows that she's taking care of all the stuff that ha has to happen for him to be able to do that. Right? Right? Again, the two have to work together. Okay. Now, now we talk about the New Testament. I mean, what if... It, a, a casual reading of the text from Paul, without understanding a Hebraic background, would convince you that Paul is a misogynist, that he hates women. Amen. Right? I mean, why would he say things like, I don't allow a woman to speak in church, I don't want a woman to teach a man, no, no woman should be in authority. All that kind of stuff, you're like, throwing, you're tearing your hair out saying, wait a minute, how can he be like that? I mean, this is... So, what happened is this, the church read Paul as though he had divorced himself from his Hebraic background, had converted from Judaism to Christianity, no longer held the Jewish views, and therefore they could interpret what Paul says out of the context of the information that we've just talked about, and change, they don't change the words, they just change the meaning of the text so that it, it fits the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Right? Just like Pagnino changed misinterpreted the word teshukah and changed the way that the church thought about women. So Paul, they, according to the way that they've read him, does the same thing. Okay? So let's take a look at what Paul says in order to figure out how does Paul take this Old Testament material, this material from the Tanakh, which he certainly knows. He's a rabbi for heaven's sake. In fact, he's one of the top rabbis in the entire world at that time. So he clearly understands the, the, the message of the Tanakh. How does he take that information and fit it into the letters that he writes to the Ephesians and the and to Timothy and all you know all of, and the Corinthians and all the places where we have problems? Okay. Um, and before we look at those, I just want to make a general comment because the question came up. Okay, so what does this have to do with the bride and Yeshua? As though somehow the Azer Konegdo has a direct relationship to the bride of Christ. And my short answer to that is. I have no idea. Ani lo I don't know. Because the metaphor of the bride and the and Christ isn't the same. It's for heaven's sake, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor about a relationship that I don't believe I see any direct connection to the Azer Connecto and Adam. Right? I mean, it's possible that the relationship that God intended between the Azer Connecto and Adam fits the relationship that individual believers have to Christ, but I don't see that connection directly. So that means that I would have to figure out how that bride-Christ relationship works and see if the patterns are the same that I find in Genesis. I can clearly see the relationship to Abraham and Sarah because the vocabulary is the same. That's intentional. It gives me the clues to find that. But I can't draw the relationship directly to the bride of Christ, because even when I go to Song of Songs, I, Song of Songs isn't an allegory about the bride of Christ. Song of Songs is erotic poetry, for heaven's sake. I mean, if we ever do Song of Songs, we'll have to do it without any children, because it's very, very explicit in Hebrew. Hebrew is never explicit. Hebrew is always about um, double entendre and and you know things hidden between the lines. But the, but it's not allegory. It's not about it's not about Christ and the church. And, and from a Jewish perspective, it's not about God and Israel either. It's about love between a man and a woman and what that dynamic looks like. In fact, I would argue that Song of Songs is a poem written as though it were from Eve in Chava in the garden before the fall. If you read it like that, I mean, come on, think about it. Think about what the relationship must have been like before the fall. I mean, can you imagine that? What a fantastic relationship that would have been. 
And if I read Song of Songs, that's what I see. So, so I would love to be able to say, you know, this is a direct parallel to the bride and uh, as the church and Christ as the head of the church, but I, I don't know how that fits. Right? And if you have a, some insight on that, it would be great. And we can write another book. <laughs> okay? But in the meantime, let's take a look at these New Testament examples. Oh, say, so 1 Corinthians 13, 11, 3. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, 3 is, uh, um, you know, a Christ, uh, it goes like this. Christ is the head of man, man is the head of the woman, uh, God is the head of Christ. Okay? That's the analogy. Now, from just strictly a theological point of view, it doesn't even make sense. Because when you think about it, God isn't the head of Christ. If we think in terms of authority, it can't be true. Because doesn't Yeshua himself say, all power and authority has been given to me? Right? So it can't be the case that Yeshua says, all power and authority has been given to me, and Paul writes that God is the authority over Christ. Right? You see? So theologically it doesn't make any sense. But, from a rabbinic point of view, it makes perfect sense. Because the word kephale, which is translated, which is the word for head in Greek, is translated in two different ways. Unfortunately, Christians translate that as authority, as though it meant the head of the corporation, okay? The CEO. But kephale never means authority in any Greek text inside or outside the Bible. And the best example that you can get for that research is Gilbert Belzekin's Beyond Sex Roles, where he goes through an, a huge appendix and looks at every example of kephale in all of the extra-biblical material, in the classical Greek material, and in the biblical material, and concludes that there is no case where kephale means authority. You know what it means? Source. Like the head of a river. Okay? Now, if Paul says that man is the source of woman, isn't he saying exactly what happens in Genesis chapter 2? Because man is the source of woman. Woman comes out of man. So if I say man is the head of woman, and I mean that man is the source of woman, it makes perfect sense. Does the rest of the analogy make sense? Is Christ the source of the man? You bet in, in uh, the apostolic writings, the new man is directly related to the source Christ. Right? The Messiah is the source of the new man. Okay? What about God is the head of Christ? Is God Yahweh the source of the Messiah? Yes. Absolutely. Yahweh sent the Messiah. He comes as, the Messiah comes as Yahweh's messenger. So the analogy makes perfect sense, even theologically, if I read it as source. It doesn't make any sense if I read it as authority. Right? So somebody who argues... Yeah, but Paul said that men are the head of women. Doesn't understand how the Greek works or how the analogy works. Right? There's no justification. And in fact, there's no scripture at all that suggests that men dominate women. That men have direct control and authority over women. In fact, everything in the Bible suggests just the opposite. And remember Deborah? You know, she's one of the, what do we call her? One of the judges. Yeah, but guess what the Hebrew word is? The Hebrew word for judges is Elohim. Right? The Hebrew word for judges doesn't mean judge like we think of somebody sitting in a courtroom. It means chieftains. And what that means is the head of the tribe. So if Deborah can act as the head of the tribe, right, we would expect that women would be recognized as potential candidates for any position in the tribe, from head, from chief of the tribe right on down. Okay? And doesn't Paul recognize that women were instrumental in the delivery of the good news across the Mediterranean world? Absolutely. And doesn't, doesn't Acts suggest that one of the prophets that they visited on their way back to Jerusalem had four daughters who were prophetesses? Right? I mean, are you going to tell me that prophetesses don't have any status in the community? That they're under the authority of the man, etc., etc.? Right? Now I realize that there's all those crazy passages and numbers about vows and taking of vows and who can, you know, and who can uh, override a vow and who can't and all that stuff. But you need to read the context of that. 
and the context is very, very different than the way it's normally interpreted. And if you really are interested in those kinds of technical details, you can go to my website, which I talk where I talk about those particular verses. Okay, but when it comes to the New Testament documents, the thing that we need to recognize is that kephale, which is the usual Greek word translated head, never means authority. Exousia is authority. Yes. You put into the question I had saved for later on. So okay. Do you want to save it for later on? Or do you um, want to can I just ask it now? Sure. You can ask, and right. then I'll save the answer. The, the, <laughs> the Adventist Church are having a big meeting in the US. I think it's a few weeks' time to discuss this very issue about women having roles within the church. Yeah. So I don't want them to. As I'm asking what the book talks about or brings out. Okay, so the, so the point is, when you examine the Greek text from the, from the position of Paul as a rabbi, what you have to conclude is that Paul would never say anything that would violate any of the rabbinic ideas of the Torah. He's ne Paul will never contradict the Torah. Why? Because the Torah is his Bible. He doesn't have, you know, he's not going to run off and... <coughs> yeah, we've got seven minutes left. We have 10 minutes left? Yeah. Okay. I thought we were going until 5.30. Oh. Come back tomorrow for the answer. <laughs> no, I'll, at least I'll answer the question. Here's, here's the point. Um, Paul will never say anything that will violate Torah. Therefore, what we've learned about Torah, Paul will not violate. Right? What we've learned about Torah is that the Azer Connecto has a has a specific relationship management role of authority in the relationship with husband and wife, right? And we've learned in Torah that women play not only that role, but roles in international business, roles in management, roles in consulting, roles in economics, and by the way, roles as chieftains, head of the tribe. So why would Paul ever suggest anything else? He knows all those stories. Roles like Esther, who saves the entire nation, right? Roles like Ruth, who's a Gentile who, who, if you ever read Ruth, you can get my commentary on Ruth online, and what you'll discover is that Ruth's story is not about Ruth and Boaz. Ruth's story is about Abraham and Lot, right? Ruth's story is about healing generational gaps, generational breaks that have been going on for hundreds of years. That's what's happening in Ruth. And Ruth, as the Gentile, plays that role. In fact, she plays the role of God. Right? If that's true, then why would Paul ever suggest that women can't have that role in the community? I'll tell you why. Because the church doesn't want them to have the role. That's why. Because the church is a male hierarchy club. Right? And that, but that's not the way God designed it. Okay? Now, since I only have seven minutes left, <laughs> we're going to finish this next, we'll do the next statement, and then we'll come back. And this is the good one. So Ephesians 2.22. Is that what it is? Yeah. 5.22. Oh, sorry. Ephesians 5.22. You can look it up. When you look it up, you should see a word in italics. And the word in italics should be submit. Or maybe it's 5.23. What does it say? I have it, but it's not, it's not italicizing this one. Wives should submit to their husbands. What's it say? Submit. It's like, what is it? Read it again. Wives should submit to their husbands. Okay. Is should submit in italics? Not in this one, no. no really? No. Yeah. Mind, this you may bad. now throw that Bible away. <laughs> <laughs> because in Greek, there is no word in that sentence for submit. In Greek, in the actual Greek text, it says, wives to your husbands. There's no verb in that verse. Okay? So, here's what I suggest. You're married to him, right? You fill in whatever verb you want. Okay? Thanks, in, in, This is called... Yeah, I think you should fill in wives. Command your husbands. Wives. Take over the job of your husbands. Wives. You can put in any verb you want because there's no verb there. But... What Paul does is what's called an ellipsis in Greek. In other words, he writes something. Okay. He writes something that suggests that the verb comes from a different sentence and it's implied in this verse, which is why the translators put submit in there, right? Okay? 
So the translators know that there's no Greek and no Greek verb in there, but they add it, and they don't add it arbitrarily. I would I would put in there if I were you, wives, dominate your husbands. I think that would be a good one. <laughs> okay. And then you could claim that you have divine authority for them. <laughs> what I would suggest is that you look to see where the verb submit comes from. Try the previous verse. What does it say? Submit to one another in the fear of the Messiah. Da-da! So what does submit? The word is hupotasso. What does the word submit mean? According to what Paul has just said, the word means mutual agreement, mutual submission. Right? So then he can take the same idea and apply it to wives. Why? Because wives have to submit, but husbands don't? No, of course not. He just said, mutually submit. And so why does he have to remind wives? Because he's writing to a Corinthian culture for heaven, or an Ephesian culture for heaven's sake. And if you know anything about Ephesus, have you been to Ephesus? No. Okay, so get, get on the boat, come with me to Ephesus. I'm going to be there next year sometime, I hope. And we're going to walk down the main street in Ephesus. And guess what you're going to find? The temple to Diana, the temple to Zeus, the temple to Artemis, the temple to... Oh, and there's the synagogue. In other words, Ephesus is packed full of pagan religions. What do pagan religions teach about the role between husband and wife? Wives are property. Right? Now, the wife and the husband come into the synagogue. They, dis they discover the joy of the Messiah. They are freed from those pagan ideas. What do you suppose wives are going to do? They're going to say, this is fantastic. I'm not property anymore. My heavens. If I can do what, I, what I've always wanted to do, and you don't have the power of Zeus to tell me otherwise, I'm free. And so Paul has to say, don't forget, mutually submit. Wives, submit. He's reminding them because in that culture, the first thing the wife is going to do is realize her freedom. Oh, this is awesome. I can go shopping. <laughs> right? And you, by the way, here's the verb. It's wives to your husbands, right? Wives, pay the bills, husbands. That's, that's what it should say, right? No, I mean, the whole, you see, he's writing to a particular community. And in that community, this is an issue, and so he reiterates it. But the point is, he doesn't reiterate it to make a husband feel like he has domination over his wife. He reiterates it because he wants both of them to agree together that this is what happens. And what that verse really means is this. There's no you and me. There's only us. All right? So now somebody will say, yeah, but that works until you have to make a decision. And then somebody has to decide. And so then they ask me, yeah, but who decides? And the answer is, the one who submits. Everyone. Did you figure that out? Both of them. That's right. So here's what happens. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision because you've got to decide if you're going to take the job in Plymouth or not. And you have to, uh, have to and you decide that you have to agree. And you don't agree. So what do you do? Mutual submission. What do you do? You say, you say, you know, I love you so much, I'll agree we're not going to go. And what does she say? You know, I love you so much, it's okay, we can go. And you say, no, no, it's okay, I understand. You don't have to go. And she says, no, please, if this is what you really want to do, then I love you and we'll go. And you say, no, it's okay, I don't have to go. You see? You see what I'm saying? It's mutual submission. It is never the case that the Bible ever instructs that a husband will tell his wife what to do. It's always the case that you must agree. And, by the way, if you can't agree, you agree. Yeah, you're agreeing on, on, no, you're, agreeing you're agreeing not to do anything because you can't agree. Until you can agree. Correct. It's always us. It's never you and me. Okay? And that's what Paul has in mind in Ephesians. So now... Anyone who comes to you and says, by the way, Paul teaches that wives should submit to their husbands. You just remind them that there's no verb there, and I'll put in any verb I want, thank you very much, unless you're willing to accept the verb from the previous verse. In which case, it must be some mutual. Right? And by the way, you can see that that's exactly what the Genesis account suggests. Because it doesn't suggest that 
that the Azer Konegdo does anything independently of the husband, nor does it suggest that the husband has any domination over the Azer Konegdo. It suggests that the two of them have to work together to achieve the prime purpose, which is to be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, subdue, and bring about the Garden of Eden in every place that they live. Right? It has to be like that. So ultimately what it amounts to is this. You learn to submit to each other. You learn that the other person's agenda is more important than yours. Which, by the way, is exactly what Paul says. Doesn't he say, don't count yourself more important than someone else? And, you, and we think, oh yeah, he's just talking about my neighbor. No, I don't think so. He's talking about your wife or your husband, right? You learn what that behavior is about. And Ephesians is just an emphasis on that behavior. Okay, so let's try one more. A matter of authority. Good question? No. Okay, so in, in legal thought and in logic, there are two kinds of authority, and we have to make sure that we understand which one we're talking about when it comes to Scripture. There's de jure authority and de facto authority. De jure authority is, as you might guess from French, a de jure authority is an authority that's granted by law. Okay? It's jur, jurisprudence. Okay? So what this means is this. A policeman in your country has a certain authority. He doesn't have it inherently. He has it because it's granted to him by law. Okay? So, he has the right to stop you if you're speeding and give you a ticket. I understand in Britain you don't have to do that anymore. You simply go by the camera and it sends you a ticket in the mail. Aren't you lucky? Yeah. Okay? In the United States we are still civilized enough to realize that not everyone who's driving the car is the owner of the car. Okay. So anyway. Well, we have cameras. I know we do. You know very well we do. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will tell you that, and this is just an aside, but it's a wonderful one, that I filed a class action suit against a city in Orlando for giving me a, a ticket when the only thing that they had was the picture of my car, not the driver, and I won. And they had to repay every single driver they had ever given a ticket to with a camera. It cost them millions of dollars. But, but then they changed the law. Right. That's the way it always works. Okay. Nevertheless, that's de jure authority, which means it's under the law. So while the policeman can stop me for speeding, he can't come into my house and take a beer out of my refrigerator because he's a policeman. Right? He's not granted that authority. Does your authority is what he's granted according to the law? Right? By the way, God has de jure authority. Why? Because he owns everything. Therefore, he has authority over everything. The only difference is that God hardly ever uses de jure authority. Most of the time, God does not exercise his sovereignty. Sometimes he does. Genesis chapter 6. But very rarely, and in most cases, even when he tells you he has de jure authority, he changes his mind. Right? Okay.